We'll pray. Father, we thank you for this day, your goodness, your blessing, the help you've given. And now as we come to this time of study, we ask that you will refresh us and help us to absorb all that we can to be better students and teachers of your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, nothing like a quiz. So, let's, uh, you enjoyed the one last week so much that I didn't want to pass them back. Here, pass them back there, too. All right. It's either true or false. Go to it. Let's see what we come up with. Okay, another minute. All right. Uh, number one, the word apostle originally an English word. True, false? False. false. It's from the Greek into the English. It's a stolen, borrowed word. Two, word baptism is a translation. False. Uh, it's a transliteration. Just the letters are carried over, not the meaning. Three, the best way to find the meaning of a Bible word is to use a dictionary. False, false. false. Uh, four, a word always has the same meaning in each place where it appears. False. Oh, they're all false. Oh, all right, here we go. Uh, the word deacon is a translation. <laughs> false it's a transliteration again the word is not translated it means servant uh, six context means only the sentence in which the word appears false uh, seven may refer to an entire paragraph true 
best way to find out the meaning of Nazarite is to look in an encyclopedia. False. False. Where would you look? The Bible. The Bible. Number six explains it all. Uh, number nine, context may mean an entire chapter. True. True. Ten, the word baptism is a transliteration. True, just the letters are carried over. We're on page four. Uh, anybody need page four? We're on page four. And uh, we're starting under, under three. Under three. Uh, it gets interesting tonight, as you can see from the whiteboard. Uh, an allegory. Now we're talking about tonight allegories, parables, fables. They are all stories, stories. They are short stories. And they are stories given to illustrate a point. So they are illustrative stories. And uh, they're just different forms now. But each is extended. We've been on, you know, a, a simile is one sentence. A metaphor is one sentence. We were on those last week. But now an allegory uh, is an extension. Uh, a, a short story, really, an extended kind of metaphor. It's a figurative use, we say, an application of some supposable fact or history. And uh, there are many uh, allegories in the Bible. And allegories are composed of a string of metaphors, actually. So someone, something we're very familiar with. Let's go to Ephesians 6. Everyone's familiar with the Christian's armor. Uh, and uh, Ephesians 6, starting with verse 11, where it goes, put on the whole armor of God. Now, obviously, uh, this, this is not to be taken literally. You're, you're not to... To, uh, to put on some outfit of some kind. Uh, but it's very clear what it's about. Uh, the whole armor, stand against the wiles of the devil. It's a spiritual battle with a spiritual individual who wrestle not against flesh and blood, so on. And, and so stand there for having... Uh, uh, Verse 14, the breastplate of righteousness. So uh, it's righteousness. Shoes, uh, the gospel of peace, the shield, verse 16, of faith. Uh, so the armor stands for warfare the, and the belt for truth, the breastplate, righteousness and the shoes for the gospel, and the shield stands for faith, the helmet, verse 17, for salvation. The sword stands for the word of God, and there you have it all. Uh, so this is an allegory. It's a little story that illustrates, made up of a string, notice, a string of metaphors uh, and it's a package that is very, it just doesn't say fight the devil, but it goes detail by detail and goes into it. Questions? No, we're okay. Everyone's seen Ephesians 6 before. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12. Uh, this you want to pay a lot of attention to this because someday this is going to describe you. Ecclesiastes 12. 
So it starts out, you know, verse 1, remember the Creator in the days of your youth. In other words, spiritually get on board when you're young, you know. And because the, the years will go by, and what we have here is a description of old age. Here we go. It's an allegory. It's a string of metaphors, uh, but it's a little, a little story. The sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return. In other words, here's uh, uh, at the beginning a, a, picture, a picture of death. And in the day, verse 3, when the, this old age picture, the keepers of the house tremble. Keepers of the house? How are you good at interpreting metaphors? How are you doing with the allegory? Your body. Uh, uh, what? Your body is shaking. It, well, narrow it down. Well, yeah, what, what, what is of more service to you than your hands and your arms, you know, that uh, the keepers of the house, what do you do? You, you know, you, you, you wash, you put on your clothes with your hands and your arms, and uh, you comb your hair with your hands and your arms, your hands and your arms take care of you, so the keepers of the house, the house is the body, the body the keepers of the house, they, are, they tremble. Uh, you, uh, you ever see, you know, an old person, boy, you, you know, they, 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 they shake. My paternal grandmother uh, shook so that they, they never filled her coffee cup more than half full because it would just slosh out. She got a hold of it, you know, and she could not, could not hold it steady. And so they, they didn't bother filling it. And you can't write any. Keepers of the house, the hands, the arms. The strong men are bent. The legs. And so on. So you're not as mobile as you were. The grinders cease. Huh? Teeth. Your teeth are falling out, you know. And, uh, uh, boy, <laughs> I think of my maternal grandfather. He had upper and lower plates, and for some reason they did not fit well. So uh, when he ate, he took them out and parked them on the table. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and then he sort of gummed his food, I guess, you know. He, he was the same one my grandmother would send him up to the butcher shop and say, well, get us, you know, a couple pork chops. He'd come home with hamburger. And she'd say, where are the pork chops? Well, they didn't have any today. <laughs> <laughs> He, he could do better with a hamburger, not eating with any teeth, you know, the grinders. Geez. Hear all these ads on radio now about implanting, huh? Oh, boy, that's the latest thing. You, you, and that's no easy business, I tell you, they, trying to promote it. But uh, the grinders cease because they are few and those who look out the windows are damned. Now we're on to the, the eyes. Uh, and you, you don't see as well. What a, what a picture. There's nothing like this in all literature. And the doors of the street are shut. Where are we? <laughs> Ears. You don't, you don't hear as well. And the sound of the grinding is low. One rises up at the sound of a bird, at some noise, you jump, you know. 
hey, read this, don't get old. Ecclesiastes 12, don't get old. The daughters of song are brought low, you're not soon. The tears of the way, <laughs> the almond tree blossoms. But you don't know what an almond tree is. Almond tree, when it blossoms, is all these white flowers. So the hair turns white. You don't have any old ladies with white hair anymore. You, you know that. They take care of it. <laughs> the grasshopper drags itself along. The slowness, you know, uh, of, of pace. And then he's going, because, now we're getting literal, man is going to his eternal home. He's going to die. But notice how beautifully death is described. Verse 6, the silver cord is snapped. It's a parallelism. The golden bowl is broken. It's a triple. Or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain. Or the wheel, the quadruple, broken at the cistern. A picture of metaphors describing death in verse 6. And then the dust returns to the earth as it was. That's a reference back to Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God for a man of the dust of the ground. So he goes back to dust. And the spirit returns to God who gave it. The person is not in the grave and so on. He goes to God. All right. So, so much for the old age passage. Let's go to Psalm 80 and try another one of these. See what we come up with. Psalm Psalm 80. And here we are. Let's start with verse 8. God's unto Israel. You are a vine out of Egypt. It's a metaphor. What's the vine? What 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 people. what people? Israel. Israel. Mm -hmm. Israel came out of Egypt. So a vine out of Egypt and drove out the nations and planted it. In other words, uh, they entered the promised land and others were cleared out. The vine is planted. It took deep root and filled the land and so on. And so it goes on. This is a little story about, uh, about Israel here, here, and so on. And it sent out its branches, verse 11, to the sea. The branches are the people. It shoots people again to the river, which is Euphrates, obviously. So verse 14, look now from heaven and see, have regard for this vine Israel is represented under the metaphor, the figure of a vine. Got it? Uh, so we're on allegories. Allegories are short stories made up of metaphors. There are a number in Scripture. Go to John 10. Uh, something familiar uh, to us. And... Uh, this is really a takeoff on Psalm 23, John 10. Uh, it's the sheepfold. He who does not enter by the sheepfold climbs up another way. It's thief and a robber. He who enters by the sheepfold is uh, a shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens the sheep. Hear his voice. Who's the shepherd? Jesus, look down at uh, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. 
Who are the sheep? Yeah, believers. And go to verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and so on. So it's an allegory. The shepherd and the sheep, very, very familiar. And you tie Psalm 23 with this, and you have the whole picture. So uh, in literature, can you think of, uh, apart from the Bible, can you think of anything that is an allegory? Yes, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, uh, an extended <coughs> allegory. Uh, the pilgrim, of course, is the, the believer, and he's on his way to heaven, loaded with metaphors, and it's the whole thing is just an illustration, a story, a picture, an allegory, actually, of the Christian's life. And the pilgrim is the Christian, and on and on John Bunyan goes with it. And uh, the whole thing in Revelation 18 on Babylon, that's an allegory. It's not a literal city. It's the world system, Revelation 18, the world system of evil. Okay. Let's uh, go to another one. Let's go to a fable. Uh, let's try Judges 9 on this. This is an interesting little one. Judges, Judges 9. I went right past it. Okay, let's uh, start with verse 1 to get the picture here. Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel. So here is who this is about. Now we'll start with verse 6 and pick this up. And all the leaders of Shechem came together at Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king. This is during the time of the judges, but they decide they're going to have a king and not, uh, not a judge. So, and it was told to Jotham. And he went and stood up on Mount Gerizim in Samaria, northern kingdom, cried aloud and said, Listen to me, you leaders of Shechem, that God may listen to you. Now, here comes the fable. A fable is a figure, it's a little story again, in which uh, human qualities are given to animals or inanimate things. Uh, surely, your mother read to you when you were growing up, whose fables? Aesop's, Aesop's fables, animals acting like people. And you find that same figure of speech in the Bible. The trees, okay, the trees are represented as people, went out to anoint a king over them. They said to the olive tree, reign over us. Olive tree, good or bad? Good, yes. Uh, olive oil, valuable. Olive tree said to them, Shall I leave my abundance by which the gods and men have, are honored and go and hold sway over the trees? Said to the fig tree, Good or bad? Good. Good. Like figs, you come and reign over us. Fig tree said, No, not leave my sweetness, and so on. Said to the vine, Good or bad? Good. Good. Great. Come and reign over us. Shall I leave? My wine that cheers God and men and go and swell. Then all the trees said to the bramble, the thistle, the briar bush, come and reign over us. And as the bramble said, verse 15, if in good faith you are anointing me king over you, then come, take refuge in my shade, if not, and so on. Who is the bramble 
a briar bush. Huh? Abimelech, the no good guy that they want to make king. It's really, the story from Jotham is really a kick in the shins for the people and for this no good that they're going to make king over them. They, they couldn't, what, and now the gist of it is, couldn't you find anybody better than this thorn bush, you know? And uh, these grew rapidly in that country with a little rain and were just a, a nuisance. Brambles, briar bush. So, so for that, let's let's pick up another. Second Kings, fourteen. Second Kings. 14, and we're starting about at verse 8 here. And Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu. Uh, Amaziah is the king in Judah. Jehoahaz is in the northern kingdom in Israel. Come, let us look one another in the face. And Jehoahaz, king of Israel, sent word to Amaziah, king of Judy, Judah. He sent him a little story. A thistle on Lebanon, on Mount Lebanon, sent to a cedar on Lebanon, saying, Give your daughter to my son for a wife. And a wild beast of Lebanon passed by and trampled on the thistle. Uh... So Jehoahaz is calling who a thistle. Yes, it's an insult uh, delivered in this little uh, cutting, brutal insult delivered to him. That's it. So we've got uh, allegories where you have... Uh, metaphors strung together to make a little story, the shepherd and the sheep, the Christian's armor, you got fables, uh, and uh, then where you have animals and things acting like people. And now we're going to go for a moment to parables, which are common, Old and New Testament. Uh, 2 Samuel 12, let's take a look at this one, 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter. This is a famous one. What you can do with a story that you cannot do with straight speech David, who's king, has taken another man's wife, Uriah's wife, and impregnated her, stolen her really, and killed Uriah. And so it's a double sin of adultery and murder. And then everything calms down. And about a year passes. And then 2 Samuel 12, you read that other in the 11th chapter. 2 Samuel 12, who shows up uh, on David's doorstep? Nathan. Nathan the prophet, a non-writing prophet. Chapter 12, the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came and said to him, there were two men. Uh, now, in that day, remember that the king is an absolute monarch. Uh, there is no court system. If the king did not like somebody, He's gone. 
This is basically what you have in Saudi Arabia today. What happened to the journalists in Constantinople, you know? Uh, they had a little visit with him and carried the pieces out in diplomatic attaché cases. Uh, and he'd gone. And uh, so Nathan knows this. In other words, when you go to the king, you, uh, th this may be your last day. So he has a story. Two men in a certain city, one rich, the other poor, the rich man, flocks, herds, poor man, nothing, a little ewe lamb brought, grew up uh, with him and his children, and so on. Now there, verse 4, a traveler to the, came to the rich man and he was unwilling to take of his own flock, so he took the little lamb from the poor man and fed it to his guest. Verse 5, did the story work? Yeah. Yes. Everyone has some sense of justice, some sense of right and wrong. David is furious, and, uh, and the man, he says, you know, who did this, verse end of five, deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and he had no pity. Then there's your, your story, and David, Nathan comes down on David, you are the man. So here, here's a case of a parable, the parable of the rich man and the poor man, and the rich man and all his flocks, and the poor man, one little lamb. It's a parable. It's in the Old Testament and was used to convict David of his, his sinfulness. Let's go to Luke 15. The setting is that Jesus has been accused of uh, hanging out, verse 1, with tax collectors and sinners. And so at the end of verse 2, this man, Jesus, Luke 15, 2, receives sinners and eats with them. Oh, boy, he's, you know cozying up with the wrong crowd. So Jesus told them what? A parable. Now, you often hear that there are three parables in this chapter. I'm going to stay with the text. How many parables are there? One, a parable. And there are three parts to the story. Here's a three-part parable. And the one builds on the other. You have, first of all, uh, parable number, number one. Starts with verse three. A man has a hundred sheep. One is lost. He goes until he finds it. Uh, you have sheep, and the lost one is one out of 100. Next, verse 8, the woman, 10 silver coins. It's thought that these are just not ordinary coins like you'd go to the market with, but were part of the marriage headdress. Uh, this is comparable to a wedding ring today. And there were 10 of these. And so she is in a dither when she loses one. It's just not, you know, like you, you misplaced a quarter or something. This is not the, the point. That uh, this had uh, uh, value beyond coinage. And she's going through the whole house 
cleaning and sweeping and looking until she finds it. So you had one out of 100. Now you've got one out of 10. Then we come to the third part of the parable. The man had two sons, and one turns out to be a bum. Uh, and uh, so you got one out of 100. Now you got one out of 10, and now you have one out of two. The, the lamb is valuable. The coin is still more valuable. And obviously the son has tremendous value. And so wh what's, what's the point of the threefold parable? Yes. Make a point to emphasize. And what is it? What? That the lost thing is important. Yes. And that's where we started out. He's with the tax collectors and the sinners. These people are important. They're valuable. What's, what's your case, you know? And I'm giving attention to them. And uh, so... A parable. And while we're here, let's, let's look at uh, chapter 16. Chapter 16, mm, verse 19. There was a rich man. Now, f for some unknown reason, the ESV dropped a word from the Greek here. The King James, who, who has the King James? Any <laughs> idea? Nobody here has it. No. You have which? He's got, he gets which in the phone. Oh, okay. The King James is there was a certain rich man. So you have the rich man and Lazarus. Is this a parable? No, it doesn't say it's a parable. Almost any Bible student, you know, preacher, they say the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, sometimes a heading in a Bible will read the parable. But it doesn't say it's a parable. Now you go back to chapter 15. Jesus says, I I'm going to tell you a parable. And invariably a parable is labeled. You don't have to figure it out. So this is the rich man and Lazarus is, is not a parable. Let's go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13 is really a, a, the, the parable chapter. You have seven parables in this chapter, all of which we have heard many times. Seven parables in the same day. Verse 3, they've gathered by the seashore, and Jesus told them many things, verse 3, in parables. They're labeled again, see. They're labeled parables. And there's, here's the parable of the sower. And, of course, notice that this he explains this, verse 18, so you don't have to figure it out. The explanation is given right, right in the scripture itself. So you have all of this. And then you have verse 24, uh, the tares, the parable of the weeds or the tares. And that's explained, starting with verse 36. So, so these seven parables on the kingdom... Two of them are explained right in this long chapter. Let's move on to one other item here now. Personification. This is that figure of speech that appears in the fable. Notice fables, personification, where you have inanimate things uh, acting uh, like, like human beings. 
and you don't want to take them literally. Inanimate things spoken of, yeah, or, or animals given human qualities. Let's go to Numbers, Numbers 16. Uh, get us a couple of these. Numbers 16, we're looking at verse 30, 31 and 2 here. Uh, as soon as he had finished speaking, Moses, uh, these words, the ground under them, that is Korah, split apart, and the earth opened its mouth. Wow. That's a human activity. It's a personification. Swallowed them. Uh, it's more, notice the figure is more powerful than literal language. Literal language would be the earth split and they fell in the crack, you know, uh, but opened its mouth and swallowed them as far stronger. Go to Isaiah 14. With me, Isaiah 14, and we're looking uh, at verse uh, 7 in this chapter. The prophets have a lot of figures of speech. Verse 7, the whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. The cypress, that is the cypress trees, rejoice. The cedars of Lebanon sing. So you got trees talking, cypress trees rejoicing, uh, obvious real personifications. Uh, Genesis 4.10. 4, 10. In Genesis, Cain has just killed Abel, and God is closing in on him. Verse 10, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me. He has the blood crying to him. Personification again. Job 12, while we're back in the Old Testament here. Job 12, we'll look at verse 7. But ask the beasts, and they will teach you. Ah, oh, we have animals for teachers. And the birds, they will tell you. We've got talking birds now. Uh, personification, again, uh, all the way through here. Uh, let's see, Leviticus 18.25. A lot of personifications, 18.25. And the land became unclean, so I punished it iniquity. And the land vomited out its inhabitants. Oh, okay. Uh, another example of this kind of thing. Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, 42. We're looking at... 3242, I will make arrows drunk, oh, with blood. Uh, the sword shall devour flesh. What's the point? What's the point of the personification? There's going to be bloodbath. Uh, blood There's going to be war and it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. Let's go to Isaiah 55. Before we leave this, Isaiah 55. Uh, so never, never get caught in a trap, you know. 
somebody says, do you take the Bible literally? Yes, all the literal parts. The literal parts. But uh, Isaiah 55, 12. You shall go out with joy, be led forth. The mountains and the hills will be singing. It's personification. Um, I don't, you know, doesn't mean that the, means there's joy. Doesn't mean that the mountains are singing. And the trees of the field shall the clear personification again in, in this one. So I, I don't take that literally, no. Do you take the Bible? Well, I don't take, I don't take a figure of speech literally. I understand what the point is, and I believe that, but I don't take a figure of speech literally. The Psalms are loaded with figures of speech, uh, and, uh, and so on. All right. And uh, it, 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 we're, we're coming next to a metonymy, and that's next week. And that's uh, a little hard plowing, but we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it. There's still more figures of speech and uh, so on. You have to understand them. Look for them. Listen for them in everyday language. Uh, and they're not figures of speech, of course are not confined to the Bible. They're in all literature. We talked about Pilgrim's Progress, Aesop's Fables, and so it goes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to have the wisdom we need to understand it and to accurately read it. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.